Hello, my name is David, the surgeon, and I'm introducing this session on the cataloguing of sculpture. The cataloguing of sculpture, and perhaps especially in the Renaissance period, which is what we're mostly going to concentrate upon, is a very special kind of discipline, because frankly, the cataloguing of paintings and of drawings is comparatively simpler. It's not absolutely effortlessly easy either, but it isn't as hard as the cataloguing of sculpture. There are reasons for this, and the main one is that sculpture is more of a semi-industrial process and it's more of a collaborative activity. You can have two different people scribbling on a sheet of paper, but on the whole, it's one person. So when you look at a drawing, you're deciding, is the drawing by Raphael or is it not by Raphael, by somebody close to Raphael, somebody copying Raphael later, and so on. In the case of sculpture, it's much more tricky and in another sense, therefore, much more fun as a battlefield. Uh, so I'm going to pass over now to my old friend, Andrew Butterfield. Uh, hello, uh, I am Andrew Butterfield, um, and uh, I will begin uh, with a few uh, general remarks about uh, cataloging sculpture and uh, some of the technical problems we have and the connoisseurship issues and uh, even the taxonomic uh, problems we have of what to call a different form, a different um, categories of production. So um, we, uh, I'll begin with uh, a few words about Ghiberti and Donatello uh, because in many uh, senses, as you all know, the, the early Renaissance was the uh, time when uh, sculptors uh, finally fully emerged as uh, uh, major artists and were seen as major artists. Of course, there had been many eminent sculptors before then, but uh, there, I think we can all agree there was a change in the early 15th century uh, where Ghiberti and Donatello be, uh, achieved a kind of celebrity um, that was new and set a, a pattern for uh, subsequent uh, artists and sculptors. Um, part of their achievement was to uh, organize the activity of uh, teams of subordinates um, and the subordinates uh, of very great accomplishment in their own right. So um, if you think of Ghiberti, um, whose uh, two sets of doors were uh, uh, transformative for Renaissance art, um, you also have to see that part of his achievement was to uh, successfully manage uh, great artists uh, in their own right, such as Michelozzo and Luca della Robbia, to contribute to uh, his effort um, so that um, uh, he could make something on an un almost unprecedented scale and uh, with an unprecedented degree of resolution and uh, technical and uh, uh, theoretical sophistication. Um, and um, so that a work by Ghiberti is, uh, and, and have it be an expression of his unique vision and his unique personality, uh, artistic personality. Um, so uh, an artist such as Ghiberti or Donatello had a workshop of approximately 20 to 30 people. And uh, that is um, something we, uh, a scale of, of activity that we continue to see throughout the Renaissance uh, in the major workshops, in the major, for the major, major artists. Um, it um, was said by, uh, in one of the few catalog raisonnés that has actually been written on a 15th century sculpture, sculptor, Jansen's Donatello, which is a very uh, fundamental text for the study of Renaissance sculpture. 
Jensen actually says at one point in, the, in his uh, analysis of the Prado pulpit of Donatello and, and Michelozzo, that the notion of autographness of Eigenhandigkeit is actually misleading when talking about 15th century sculpture because of the role of, uh, of collaboration. Um, another good example from Donatello of this problem is the Cantoria in the Duomo. The Cantoria in the Duomo, as you all know, is a extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary work um, with um, that is whose style in the, in the depiction of the figures and the depiction of the drapery is completely unprecedented, and whose architecture is uh, style is also the arch architectural elements also are. Um, unique, and yet uh, the documents are very clear that Donatello made this with uh, pluris magistri, with many masters. And uh, we don't know who they are, we don't know what that means, but uh, it's significant that the document says that, um, that it, they were, his collaborators are masters, they're not lavoranti, they're not, they're not workers, they're not students, they're other masters. Um, so the achievement of a personal style also involved the, uh, the collaboration of other masters. Um, it's actually much more like a great filmmaker working in the 20th century than uh, perhaps a, um, uh, our standard picture of an artist working in his, uh, in his uh, you know, in, in some attic studio. Um, so the, nonetheless, despite this reality, the uh, standard way that we've gone about cataloging things has been typically to say artist, workshop, artist and workshop, workshop, fall, and these very vague categories, um, which, uh, root, which regularly uh, break down when you look at actual examples. Uh, another example is uh, Verrocchio um, with uh, the Colleoni monument in Venice. It's definitely by Verrocchio, um, and yet it's signed by another artist, Alessandro Leopardi. And um, when you examine the details of the sculpture, if, if you spend enough time on it, you can actually pick out to some degree which of the decorative elements are from Leopardi and which are from Verrocchio. Um, so as uh, David said at the outset, sculpture is a multi-stage collaborative process that's labor intensive and takes the expertise of many people to get from the stage, the initial stage of the drawings and the models to uh, a more worked up set of models and then it, either a finished marble or a cast uh, bronze, which then requires even a uh, further labor in uh, the uh, chasing, which is uh, an incredibly time-consuming uh, activity requiring great expertise. Um, so um, we also need to recognize that for the artists, there was no, there was, there was never any problem or shame in the fact that it was a collaborative activity. Uh, requiring the work of many assistants. In fact, in, they were proud of the fact that it was so uh, labor intensive. When um, Cellini was making the silver, uh, life-size silver statue of Jupiter for Francis I, and Francis I is coming to the studio, he actually says to his assistants, get busy, get busy. And he wants, to, he wants them all to be hammering away um, and um, <clears throat> showing the king how much uh, work it takes. Um, so um, another issue that, uh, uh, that has particularly excited uh, uh, trouble in the study of uh, Renaissance uh, sculpture is the case of John Bologna um, and um, uh, John, he, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that 
John Bologna was the first artist, perhaps, uh, I think the first artist uh, in the modern era, whose works were in production, continual production for close to 150 years. And um, from the time uh, from the 1560s uh, until uh, the early 18th century, um, some of his models were in being made by uh, artists with working from his models and his um, uh, molds and sometimes working in his former workshop uh, in, uh, with great fidelity to his original conception. And uh, this has led to a style of cataloging John Bologna, which where we distinguish between John Bologna, we, and works made after John Bologna. Um, and um, so if a work is after John Bologna, we will often say, oh, from a model by John Bologna. Uh, and uh, Antonio Suzini, for example, from a model by John Bologna. But um, this has led to a great deal of uncertainty and, and uh, frankly, uh, to chaos in the cataloging of this material. Um, uh, we, particularly because um, both the uh, market and museums have come to value an attribution to Antonio Suzini, um, even though he is himself something of an unknown entity uh, or imperfectly known entity who also had his own assistants and some of whom were said to be better than, John, than Suzini in chasing. So, it's it, the, these are just some of the issues um, that uh, uh, we confront when talking about um, the cataloging of Renaissance and Baroque sculpture. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was extremely illuminating, and I'm already pondering the thought that uh, whereas in the South Pacific there's nothing like a Dane. Uh, in the context of sculpture, there's nothing like a name. Now, next, I'm handing over to Philippe Malgour, uh, who's going to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to, to address another topic which is related to what Andrew just exposed to us. And it's not about the difficulties of a subject for theme, that is to say the making of sculpture in its own time, but it's um, about the way we know things we know. That is to say, we are not invited by a grieving widow uh, in the workshop to sort out, to catalog the work of the artist. Works have a long history between their creation and the time we start to study them. And in this history, there has been some knowledge, knowledge built by others, uh, other people uh, having to deal with the same same difficulties and these works, this body of work, which really is uh, or discipline, uh, is in itself a problem we have to deal with. That is to say, how to establish an authority in this field where um, attributions, because that's the main problem we have to deal with, where works are documented uh, in a way or in another, uh, it shouldn't be uh, that uh, problematic. So I, I would like to, to address this topic of um, the way we sort out the difficulties of dealing with uh, our own way of building knowledge and uh, how to use the knowledge uh, built it by uh, others. And the first of all, we have to, to question whether this uh, previous uh, science in our field is reali reliable. On what is it grounded? We have a right to know uh, about that. And uh, of course, um, the fact that somebody is an authority on such and such culture, we have to rely because the, the sources are are mute or absent. So we have to rely on Janssen or Tolne, and we have to believe him somehow because he's so familiar with his theme. But um, 
we know also when we have a chance, as it's the case for the greater artists in our um, in our in our period, to have several uh, monograph or several catalogue raisonné, and that's a very good thing because we it enables us to get out of this kind of authoritarian frame of this tyrannical thing that the catalogue raisonné might be. Because if it's not in the catalogue raisonné, then the work is supposed to be wrong, which uh, for obvious reasons, we know it might not be the case in for the period we are uh, dealing uh, with. So there is maybe there is Blunt uh, Nicolas Poussin, and there is Rosenberg's Nicolas Poussin, there is Tuilier's Nicolas Poussin, and they are not quite the same uh, the same person because at some point we have to build an inner uh, picture of this artist we never met, and so uh, it's true that we have the right to say, no, this, I, 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 I feel that it can't be by Donatello and not being exactly able to explain why. And I respect this, um, this assessment. I, I, it might be right because it's an accumulated experience of connoisseurship that might be valuable. But I would like to read this uh, short uh, passage of this, uh, this book I like uh, very much uh, of Friedlander of um, 1942 on connoisseurship. And that's what he, he wrote. Our courage to proceed to the determination of authorship, whether we go by intuition or by analysis and objective criteria, we derive from a belief that creative individuality has an intangible core. We start on the assumption that the artist, whatever he experiences, whatever impulses he receives, however he may change his abode, at bottom remains the same. And that something which cannot be lost reveals itself in his every expression. This belief is often shaken by practical experience, but remains indispensable as a compass on the journey of the critic of style. If we stand in front of two works by the same master, which also both authenticated and for certain reason indubitable, yet differ greatly from one another, then the question as to what can, after all, be determined as the common denominator does take us into the very depths of things and into the very core of personality. In spite of many disappointment, we persevere in our endeavor to discover something that is unchangeably solid, and in so doing often get into the position of a man who peels an onion and in the end realizes that an onion consists of peelings. And I think it's unfortunately very true because uh, uh, when we work with uh, uh, precedent works, which I did a lot when preparing the bronze uh, Renaissance catalog from the Louvre collection, which uh, many pieces have been so uh, many times published before I start studying them. What what can I do with this body of um, uh, knowledge and uh, how to bring transparency to or science or method? Uh, I wanted to show you um, just a picture, not of my own catalog, but of a very good uh, catalog by Jeremy Warren of the uh, um, Ashmolean uh, collection in, in Oxford. And uh, you see, as in any normal catalog, under the number, you just have the title and then the attribution made by the scholar, that is to say, in two lines like in an auction catalog or on museum labels, you have summed up uh, Venetian uh, question mark, six, first, second half of 16th century or whatever. This, this is a real problem. That is to say that um, the market maybe firstly, and then the museum exacts from us uh, a, a, such a precise answer, which in most cases we're not able to honestly give. And usually people don't even read the reasoning behind this solution. They just see, oh, Warren say that it's attributed by, to such and such, and that's the end of it. So um, I decided not to write captions for the pictures in my catalog. So you have to read it and to come with the same conclusion as I do, which are often are quite unconclusive. But I wanted to be 
open in a new way, because I think that at some point, uh, the study of Renaissance culture has come to a dead end. When for more than one century, we are discussing the authorship, for instance, of or a big uh, crucifixion in, in bronze for a great plaque, we have in the Louvre between Donatello, follower of workshop, somebody else, uh, imitator, and so on. And any of, it, of these different hypotheses have not led to anything conclusive. We must understand that's not the right way to uh, deal with these uh, objects. Uh, we should do like in, in uh, what we call uh, science du hard sciences that uh, produce hypotheses only if they give up give some result and not just um, uh, throwing them in the air and waiting for them to fall down on, on our heads maybe later. So that's what I, I suggested in this uh, catalog and in the repertoire itself, the catalog, the corpus of all the works. Uh, I give an analytic bibliography where the uh, opinion of everyone is expressed is in, in his own words. So you can know precisely the history of scholarship and this subject. And in this way, I strove to give um, transparency to the way all knowledge is built. And though the eye is, of course, our main instrument, but as a scholar, I want to know if I can rely on the eye of this person in this uh, very uh, case. And the fact that um, uh, I gave up somehow uh, with the ambition of writing labels or, or captions for all these subjects, I allowed myself to look at, to look at things uh, differently. And for instance, uh, to observe uh, things correlated to what Andrew uh, discussed, that is the question of multiple, of technique, of the sheer materiality of the object, because sometimes it's not only the question of invention, which we have to solve. We say, is this uh, composition invented, conceived by Pierino da Vinci? But then we have to know what kind of relationship this concrete object has to do with the artist, as uh, Andrew said. And when we observe things very um, attentively, and we've, we, we can afford it in museum because we have almost all the time in the world where the objects are just sitting there to be studied, I realize, for instance, that uh, I, I take the example of a, of a, of a famous uh, Filarete plaquette. We have there are so few uh, known of those. And uh, while studying uh, Quattrocento Italian bronzes, I realized that uh, putting aside the difficult question of plaquettes and medals, but all this important uh, big plaquette or small relief and so on, uh, usually they were not made in multiple. So it's very interesting to realize that bronze at the beginning was not meant to multiply things, but as a specific choice of technique and color and result, but marble doesn't mean unique and bronze multiple necessarily. So we have to keep that in mind because forgers know that our mind is uh, tuned uh, to um, multiplicity in bronzes. And I realized that most of Filaret versions of his plaquettes were just aftercasts. And unfortunately, uh, most of all plaquettes are uh, aftercasts of others. And in some case, like in the, uh, the pseudo uh, so-called Cincinnatus, uh, we don't know the original. Or is the better one. But uh, if you look closely at the Berlin and uh, Washington, uh, New York uh, version, you see that they just aftercast from ores, which is already uh, uh, an aftercast. So it's, it is not to sound uh, pessimistic, <laughs> on the contrary, it is um, to maybe open up to other uh, realities and that uh, uh, to see that uh, writing catalog raisonné creates a pattern of thought and scholarship. And to do it uh, thoroughly for sculpture, we have to question this pattern because most of the time, as Andrew said, we can't uh, um, solve 
uh, or an give the answer that people are waiting um, uh, for us to give as to the concrete authorship of a precise uh, object. Thank you so much. And between those two contributions, I think we have a mass to discuss among ourselves. Then I'm going to set things in motion by, I guess, asking Andrew a question since he came first. In your comparison, which I think is an incredibly illuminating one between somebody like Ghiberti and a movie director, to what extent is it fair to say that at the time, because people maybe had more understanding of what was going on than most of us do, they would have recognized that self-evidently calling that the work of Ghiberti uh, involved other people, but that his control over it was like that, let's say, of Alfred Hitchcock. And nobody watching a Hitchcock movie imagines that he did every single thing. He wasn't manipulating the camera and designing the set and so on and so on. And in fact, you have uh, huge credits for films. Uh, Ghiberti wouldn't have thought about uh, providing that sort of supplementary information, although there are people, of course, who make a distinction between themselves as inventors and other people as casters. But it was just the way it was, wasn't it? Absolutely. Um, the, uh, the My favorite example in movies is uh, Hitchcock and um, specifically Psycho and specifically the shower sequence because there's no question that Psycho is by Hitchcock and the shower sequence is by Hitchcock. Uh, it's also the case that the storyboard for the shower sequence was by Saul Bass, a, a fantastic artist of great importance and that Hitchcock initially said, no music. I want no music. And of course, Bernard Herrmann wrote the music um, unauthorized and then Hitchcock heard it and thought this is fantastic and added it. So um, we have to imagine that something similar could happen in the past, uh, even though Ghiberti uh, in the Doors of Paradise had absolute control over the whole project. Um, it, it did take 25 years and it involved uh, the uh, efforts and the uh, input of, of, of uh, many important artists, including, as I mentioned, Michelozzo and Luca Della Robbia, who for a time worked on it. In, for the most part, we can never specify the contribution of anyone other than Ghiberti. And there was no question in anyone's mind that it was Ghiberti who was the mastermind of it. He planned it, he designed it, he, he was the one who um, would have um, uh, worked on the, the iconographic and symbolic program with any humanists who may have been involved, such as Bruni. Um, and uh, the uh, credit for the project was given to him. And he, he um, and rightly so. And he also made the, uh, you know, uh, the very handsome sum uh, sums that he made for the door. So there was never any doubt um, um, that it was by Ghiberti and his, he, he thought so, his assistants thought so, and uh, his patrons thought so, and other artists and critics later did as well. And I think it's interesting that sculptors are probably more keen in the earlier part of the 15th century and even onwards on signing their work than many painters are, which is interesting. So it's almost as if when somebody like Ghiberti signs, there might be a bracket at the end saying, and company limited, but I don't need to tell you that because you know that already. Uh, it's fascinating also this business of how it is so hard to unpick in the context of sculpture, because if you take the case of Verrocchio's, so-called Verrocchio's Baptism of Christ picture, it was recognized at a very early date and is stated by Vasari, but was clearly known before that and thought about before that, that there's an angel by the young Leonardo. So there, different chunks can be 
given over to different people who work on them completely separately. But I guess it's a technical reason that means sculpture is less likely to function in that way. Um, with uh, the case of Verrocchio, um, the sculptures, it's in the sculptures, it is almost impossible to pick, to single anything out and say, oh, this bit is not by Verrocchio. Uh, he exercised uh, uh, control over the entire production and uh, he had a kind of mania about finish uh, where he actually, I think, had trouble letting go of a piece and um, will put details in places that people can't, literally can't see on the, the um, on the, um, in the hair of uh, St. Thomas, for example. <clears throat> Whereas, as you said, in the paintings, there are chunks that seem uh, more uh, distinguishable one from the other. Um, not all sculptors were like that. A great uh, example is Desiderio de Settignano, where it is extremely difficult to say uh, which parts of the Marsipini tomb in Santa Croce are by Desiderio or Desiderio alone, or why, why are the two puti standing with the shield standing at the base of the tomb? They're both fantastic. They're clearly by different people or finished by different people. And yet, which, who is, who, that we have no real way of saying, oh, this one is Desiderio and this one is his brother or baby Verrocchio or, or what. So, um, also, to respond to what Philippe said, um, there are in many instances where the honest answer is our knowledge only goes so far. And um, we do need to do, as he suggested, um, explain in the text more um, what the issues are rather than relying just on the top, on the, on the top lines and the cataloging as um, uh, because that people are looking to that and they are misled, they can be misled by that. Whereas you really do need to explain, oh, these are the issues. These are the limits of what we know. And much of what we know, what much of what is knowable is already known. The only, um, one of the few things that gives me hope is the vast expanse in, in that we can make progress is the vast expanse in photography that now allows us to um, study sculptures in a way that uh, was not possible uh, just a short while ago. You, you know, you can have thousands of photographs of something rather than, you know, you were limited to 35 shots on a roll of film and everyone was relying on Alinari and so forth. And now we have just, corporate, you know, vast arrays of pictures that allow us to be a little bit more precise in documenting the case for an attribution. I think it's also the case that there's some kind of natural human craving for certainty and reassurance. And having things like a name is inherently <laughs> pleasing. It's not absolutely only a matter of commercial instinct to say this is a Donatello rather than this isn't quite a Donatello but I don't really know exactly who it's by golly it's very difficult and the other side of that is perhaps that we also have the responsibility not to be too despairing I mean I love the business that Philippe was explaining about not just putting a headline name, that's of course incredibly civilized and intelligent. But if you go too far in that direction, which is potentially possible, you just end up saying, well, sorry folks, we don't know anything about anything, let's surrender. And that doesn't help anybody because we know a bit more about some of the nothing we know than other bits of it. And the point- Can I answer that? <laughs> if I can say just the yeah. point about the aftercasts is of course yeah. very interesting because uh, of the, the filarates, because what you're saying is, uh, look here, 
there's a difference between this one and that one, and this is what it is. So you're giving concrete and clear explanations, uh, but it's not there. It's to do with the kind of lineage of descent of the uh, versions of the plaquette, but it's not to do with names. Uh, at some point it might be. For instance, uh, if I may, uh, first, I think I, I really believe in knowledge and we have to know what knowledge is made of. So if we start like voting, like in the election to say that uh, among specialists, like uh, 20 think it's by Donatello and three think it is not, and we don't know the reason why they don't believe it is by him. Well, what have we gained? It's not knowledge. It's, it's the opposite, it's a side of a, a, a fake knowledge, but don't, we don't really know more about the piece. So uh, I don't think we are threatened because anyway, nobody does this of <laughs> the thing I did in the catalog. And that's why it was totally unsuccessful because people are really um, angered by the fact they have to read the book and not just read the caption. So I, I can, <laughs> if I may say so, um, but the thing is, uh, what Andrew described, it's a well-known process. Of course, we know there were workshops and collaborators and pupils and so on. And that's the main problem. Because of this knowledge, this allows people to make uh, the kind of attribution we are trying to uh, avoid or um, point out. Because as it was a collaborative process, this allows people to think that there might be a wide um, uh, uh, why differences in, in quality in works, but that's not the same thing. So, it, and especially when they are small objects. So we have to understand that when we, it's not because are oh, they all at workshop and a small uh, portrait by Rubens is a workshop when it's just a, a silly copy made in the street in Antwerp at the time of Rubens maybe, but uh, I don't believe that Rubens had a special corner in his studio where people were making bad copies or mediocre copy of his own works. So uh, the, the, the knowledge we, we have of this collaborative work is a tricky thing, which leads us to be uh, maybe to not exacting enough about what we mean by autography. Of course, uh, when somebody is uh, antico, he was not casting his things. So uh, when we uh, measure alloys, for instance, we can't get anything from that. And we know from sources that he was a he was he wasn't a founder, but probably everything was chased by him because he was a goldsmith. So the question for an antico bronze would not be on metal or even technical details of uh, of, 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 of the way it, it was uh, made, but on on the surface. For another artist, it would be different. And at some point, I, I think of uh, Guibert, of uh, Verrocchio, uh, Andrew mentioned, and for instance, the uh, pseudo uh, terracotta model for the altar front in silver. And when you see them, of course, there's no question about the, <laughs> the invention being Verrocchio's. They're just the same as the, as the silver piece. But the question remains why, and the quality is, is all right, but why? a goldsmith would make a big terracotta model for something he's going to make in silver. And that's an issue you can't evade. So you see, it's not only a question about uh, multiplicity of um, people, this must be, it's a kind of screen of smoke also, which allows us to, to say, well, probably Antonio Suzini or workshop of Antonio Suzini, which is even vaguer. But we have to realize that on some object, we can't hide behind this collaborative process. And there's a real question between uh, later copy, for instance, which is a very difficult issue in sculpture, later copies seen as sketches or models. And there are plenty of those. <laughs> the, the business of something being either earlier or later in that sense, something thought to come before the definitive work as opposed to after is a very interesting one. And that whole issue is perhaps particularly tricky in the realm of sculpture. 
I was gripped also by what you were saying about you know, having a vote between uh, the number of experts who believe one thing and the number of experts who believe another thing. Isn't it the case, and we could all discuss this, that the bigger danger, and it doesn't apply to people like Donatello and Michelangelo, but once you get to a slightly lower level, it does, is that it suits everybody, not least the market, but not only the market, to designate one individual as the expert and to take that person's opinion as the gospel truth and not to want anybody else to have a say. And that seems to me very sinister. If you've got lots of different people saying lots of different things, as you explained about Poussin, for example, the one thing that anybody reading those books will understand is that they can't, they can't all be right because they're disagreeing uh, with themselves. And I have been known to say to people who contact one to ask for opinions, uh, I know I'm not always right because on occasion I've said two different things. So at least once, if not twice, I must have been wrong. And we should also accept that possibility for ourselves and uh, recognize it with other people. You Absolutely. Um, and I agree with uh, Philippe completely that um, the fundamental or a fundamental thing we're seeking is to distinguish between knowledge and what is knowable and what has to remain in the realm of opinion and inference and hypothesis. Um, and we're trying to distinguish between what is known, what is probable, what is possible, what is likely, what is unlikely. And in many cases, we don't, well, we don't have a final answer. And um, because they're just, they're, they're limits to what's knowable. Um, and uh, regarding your remark about experts, I believe that the time, there was a time when museums and the market wanted the opinion of one uh, designated authority or another. Um, I believe that's changing so that now uh, there's a greater uh, appetite for a, mul for a multiple, uh, multiple authorities. Um, there isn't, it's not the era anymore when Pope Hennessy or a Laban or someone like of, of that level of, of distinction could give a name and everyone would say, oh yes, that must be the case. I think, I think it's different now. Well, Pope Hennessy is a particularly fine example because he was an individual who had a kind of uh, institutional and personal power in his yes. life, which he gleefully exploited. And uh, somebody I know told me the story of going into his office, one of his junior colleagues at the time at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and Pope Hennessy was holding a little bronze and he explained in his inimitable tones, which I'm going to try and imitate, <laughs> the modello for the head of the Medusa of uh, Benvenuto Cellini's Perseus. And he had acquired it very, very cheaply from someone who presumably didn't know how important it was. And my friend, who was a kind of cousin of Pope Hennessy, said, you're, you're a sort of gangster. And he was incredibly flattered rather than annoyed and said, yes, but you see, it wouldn't be by Cellini unless I said it was. And at the time, that's what's so spooky. That would have been basically the case. Uh, and it could not be that. Um, I think it's changing, and I, I, I think that what we're making an effort to do is, in a sense, to show our work, as they say in, uh, in schools in America, to demonstrate the, the case and uh, to, to give more evidence, to expose what we know and what we don't, what we know with certainty and what we know with less uh, certitude. And so that other experts can review the same material uh, and come to uh, come to a conclusion uh, on their uh, on the basis of their own review of the material. We, 
rather than wrapping ourselves up in authority. Uh, there are many who still try to do that and uh, make assertions, but that's that's not the way forward in this field. No, I think I think what's difficult, and it's all very positive that, but the one thing that's tricky around it is that people saying, well, everybody's entitled to opinions of their own can go a bit too far because the truth is if any of us was told that we had to have a heart transplant, we'd want a cardiologist to do the operation, mm. uh, not a market gardener or a butcher uh, or whatever. Uh, you'd want an expert. And so it's not that you have a kind of designated expert, but people like uh, you and Philippe uh, do know your stuff because you've been thinking about it and looking about at this sort of material for a very long time. And uh, that means in a general sort of a way, you're more likely to be on the right track than somebody who's never uh, explored any of this at all. Um, one, um, uh, one general comment uh, to make about the terminology that's used for the authorship of sculpture in uh, catalog raisonnés and other uh, in, in art history uh, more broadly is that we are often trying to, using the designations like uh, by the artist, by the artist in workshop, by the workshop, to distinguish level, what we perceive to be levels of quality. So, and part of the problem is we're using a historically in a misleading set of terms to describe a, a, a different issue, namely quality and um, what we perceive to be the degree of personal involvement, which is an inference usually. And there's also uh, so what, what you just described about them, um, the, uh, things being more open and more laid on the table, but still there is still, um, if you want to get the attention and get on the stage, uh, you have to uh, pop attributions. Yeah. Even controversial one, even absurd one, and then you, we have to discuss them for they're, they're not grounded on anything, but just the, the wish to appear somehow in the bibliography of an important artist. And that's a real pollution in our field, which has nothing to do with the market, actually, but really with uh, the way academics work and Absolutely. this uh, wish of uh, visibility. And I heard uh, recently somebody said of a, of a very good monograph, a very good catalogue raisonné, oh, but he doesn't make uh, many new attributions. So that would be the rate to measure the quality of the work of somebody, if that's to, to make or to propose new attributions, regardless that for some artists, there's no room for that, or uh, it would be uh, uh, most uh, disquieting <laughs> if there were. So it's a difficulty we have to uh, deal uh, with ourselves, you know, I mean, as scholars and especially as academics, not to be tempted by this, uh, sensationalism of having an opinion or when we're being consulted but what do you think of this or that and just to say well I've not studied it I don't know um, absolutely there is um, a branch in the field of uh, science that studies the motive the motivations for scientists making mistakes and uh, there's been a lot recently in the sort of popular science press about the uh, lack of reproducibility of a, a absurdly high number of published papers. And once they they're reviewed, the 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 it turns out the test results aren't correct, or the you know the the math and uh, the statistical table wasn't done correctly, or something like that. And they study the reasons for this, and it has to do with uh, fame, because even a inaccurate article can advance your career. So um, the, the motives to make big grand claims um, routinely have nothing to do with money. They have to do with uh, other notions of advancement um, and celebrity status, uh, um, getting in the bibliography.
it might be better if people took what you might describe as a defensive attitude and just really tried hard not to screw up big time. And <laughs> think of a case outside of our field, like the Hitler Diaries. Mm. You, Trevor Roper, authenticated the Hitler Diaries on the basis pretty much of nothing. Uh, he was a very, very distinguished historian. Fantastic. But part of his legacy now is you, Trevor Roper, that very great historian who made a moronic mistake over the Hitler diaries. If he just buttoned his lip, <laughs> he'd have been better off in every possible way. And um, as Philippe was saying, silence is a perfectly respectable uh, approach to the problem. And we've been talking a lot about the difficulty. And I think one other thing, and it comes from the field of painting as a matter of fact that might make one brood on quite how great that difficulty is, is that in certain cases, we might feel, wouldn't it be fantastic if I could only get hold of a time machine and just go back and find out what the hell of course. is going on or who was making this work of art. But in Vasari's uh, discussion uh, of the copy by Andrea del Sarto of the Raphael portrait of Leo X and the two cardinals. He tells the story that Sarto's copy was shown to Giulio Romano, who was, of course, Raphael's closest pupil and literally his heir, the person who uh, inherited his estate in Raphael's will. And Giulio Romano starts saying, ah, yes, of course, I remember when Raphael painted this. And somebody has to break in and say, I'm terribly sorry, but um, this is, a, as a matter of fact, the copy uh, by Andrea del Sarto. It's not the original. And you think, OK, so Giulio Romano got it wrong. We <laughs> better not be too confident that we always get it right. Uh, the, the question of authority is as as we've seen um, central in, in art history especially when it comes to connoisseurship and that's the, the very essence of catalogue raisonné that is to, to say that if you work long enough on a single artist you may be able to as a uh, 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 Pope Enzi said, decide whether it was by him or not by him. And it, it becomes even truer, maybe, but what you would you have been able to check by yourself with a time machine? Mm -hmm. So that's that's a real problem because when there is one catalog raisonné, and especially if a new object comes in light or uh, an object which was uh, rejected by the author, it's very difficult. It takes generation to bring the object back in the court just because there's it's blem it, it has some blemishes. I mean, so it's a great responsibility almost. Um, it, it gives the author an almost a Luciferian power uh, uh, retrospectively on, on, on the works which were produced. And that's a serious thing to, to consider when writing about anything. And it's a terrible truth, I'm afraid. Uh, naming no names, that some people are better at this game than others. And if the poor artist uh, gets the definitive monograph written by somebody who's not incredibly good, that doesn't help the fate of that artist. And in relation to what Andrew was saying about the photography, it may be getting a bit better because it used to be the case that one doorstep like the book uh, resulted in there not being the possibility of another one for at least a generation. But now with the internet and online publishing and things of this kind, uh, you can go in and say stuff without having to find a publisher and bankrupt them and <laughs> those sorts of difficulties. And that, that could be a genuine advantage, but it wasn't like that as we've all been saying. And I would add that, um, this uh, very important uh, and documented work by Renaissance artists we ground on, on knowledge on, usually they are the worst reproduced and photographed 
uh, object, when you want to get details or good pictures, if you don't go and make them, you don't have them. And on the opposite, we have very, very good pictures of uh, problematic or lesser objects, sometimes in museum or on the market. And so they tend to, they're easier to study and they, they pull you uh, towards what, what is easier to, to work on, what is best photograph. So that would be a real uh, challenge and something to, to work on is to work on the good detailed pictures of documented works, uh, big tombs, uh, big monuments, where it's, it's, which are the, the ground to make any comparison with smaller works and uh, sure works for uh, collaborative, but if Ghiberti dying to sign it, I think he was happy with it. So that's, that's a, a real uh, question for the future. I think there's one other that follows on from it, which is what is to be done about those very great works of art, which for the same reason are invisible in plain sight. Really, nobody can see the Mona Lisa because you're not allowed near enough. And, you know, we are all between us at the very least in the middle of our lives, let's put it politely, but we've got over 150 years between the three of us. Uh, we've never seen uh, Michelangelo's St. Peter's Pieta because you can't get near it. We've seen it better in a photograph than you see it in front of the real thing, even using binoculars, it's insane. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yeah, and that problem is getting worse um, as uh, there are more and more of the great monuments in, in the Italian Renaissance, at least, certainly, become inaccessible as the pressures from crowds and tourism increase. You know, you, we all used to walk into, I don't know, uh, the old sacristy and just stay there for an hour or what have you, or the arena chapel and just stay there. And now if you, you know, the, the access is extremely limited. Yeah, in fact, at a time or thereabouts. When people say to me, what's the point of being an art historian? I always give the same answer, which is that with luck, you get to know the guy in charge of letting people into the arena chapel or somewhere similar. And you ring them up and they ring the guards and the guards are told you can stay as long as you like, but everybody else is thrown out after 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, but that's a terrible fate. And there are, as you say, increasing numbers of great masterpieces, which are only allowed to look at for a little time. And there's not enough time. Yeah. I have no doubt that uh, Andrew and Philippe in particular could go on illuminating us till the cows come home, but all good things come to an end, even uh, this discussion. So assuming you have been, thank you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>